Uh, Jesus is the most formidable, formidable figure in human history. And this answer, this question, or this sentence right here, Jesus is, is one of the most important statements you will ever make in your life. This is one of the most important statements you will ever make in your life. This answer could give you a large amount of hope and understanding in the salvation and the freedom and the rescue that you have in Jesus Christ. Or it could bog you down. It could leave you in places of shame and regrets and pain and fear. You see, the, the, the answer to this question is so critical to our faith and so critical to our life and to our existence. You know, some people believe that he's a leader and he's full of love. He's our friend. He's our hope, our salvation, our rescue, and our forgiveness. Others see him as a lunatic or a fictitious character, an illusion of our mind, a crutch, imagery, or just an idea. One thing is true, though is that many have grown to deeply love Jesus and it's transformed their lives. If you look at John chapter 1 and verse 11, you hear the words about Jesus Christ. In verse 11 it says, He came to, a peep, to His people, His own people, and even they rejected Him. But to all who believed Him and accepted Him, He gave them the right to become children of God. They are reborn, not a physical birth, resulting from human passion or plan, but a birth that comes from God. A birth that comes from God. You see, however we look at this, for some in that verse, they never knew him. They had no idea who he was. They had never come to that conclusion or that place. They didn't recognize him when he walked among them. And some people today don't recognize who Jesus Christ is. And some, the ones who have recognized Jesus, are reborn in a birth that comes from God. Some of us, unfortunately, in our culture and our time, believe that Jesus is a, ends to, a means to an end. Like, we see him as a self-help guru of sorts, if we want to call it that. We see him as an answer of some kind, a solution of sorts to some of our life's dilemmas. We like to factor him into what we're facing instead of making him the only one. As I have written down here, he's not an answer. He is the answer. He's not an answer. He is the The answer, period, plain and simple. He's the one. He's the solution, period. And there's a dialogue going on about this. If you guys um, are online or or know anything about some of the major um, ministers out there, there's a gentleman, and I've mentioned his name a few times here. His name's Judas Smith, and he's released a book, and it's literally titled Jesus Is. And it's all about a new perspective, a new way to be human, a new way of understanding Jesus Christ. And this whole series that we're going to be embarking on over the next several weeks are based on the words that are written in that book. And I pray that we come to some practical places of understanding. Because I really believe that in some of our church settings, we've come to places where we're trying to grow to understand who Jesus Christ is. And it's not that the preacher or the leader or the people that we're studying with have made it far out of our reach of perspective and understanding. But we want to be eloquent and we want to make sure that we dissect and jump right deep into the word. And sometimes when we're understanding who Jesus is, it becomes confusing when we're comparing him and understanding who God is and where he came into being and so on. And what I want to do throughout this series is is I want to reveal to you, not overwhelm you or confuse you, but I want to reveal to you his characteristics, like his personality traits, some of the things that are personal to Jesus Christ that should change our life in a huge way. And so this morning, the first in our series is Jesus is my friend. Jesus is my friend. And this should be a profound statement in itself. 
It shouldn't be one that makes us feel like we can be calm and casual too much around him because we know that we need to reverence and respect his father and we need to know our place and standing. But the truth is, as Jesus entered the world, he was a king and he was in heaven and he decided to be born vulnerable, a human birth and walk among us and engage us and be with us and talk to us. He encountered us here. Bear with me for a moment. I want to mention some things and then get to the main point of my message here. Um, And and I don't know if you guys have heard this statement before, but some have said if God can save or if God can help so-and-so, God can help anyone. I don't know if you guys have ever heard that before. I'm sure that you have. But some people who are, I mean, just really, really good at sinning. I mean, they are skilled sinners. They're famous in their ability to make messes of their life. And you watch as one bad choice after another leads them to a place of real destruction in this life. And we see something powerful, something significant, something real happen in their life. And we say to ourselves, wow, if God can save so-and-so, if God can help this certain individual, God can help anyone. But the sad thing about this reality is it lets us see mostly good people, it allows mostly good people to look down on mostly bad people. And some people enjoy the feeling of this like condescending pity or self-righteous outrage. Uh, let, me, let me make sense of this. I don't want this to sound painful, but some people are too gleeful to hold up notorious evildoers as marvelous Marvels of depravity, and they become examples of just how bad people can get. And I don't like this because it creates a badness scale. It creates a scale of badness. Like, you know, we, we've, we come in contact with a person and they may not have accepted Christ. They may not go to church. They may not be a, a really pure and holy person, but they're mostly good. And we think to ourselves, Well, it wouldn't be that hard for someone like that to come to Christ. I mean, it won't be hard for God to reach them because they're mostly good. But then we look at the bad people and we think to ourselves, man, God's really going to have to bring them down before he can bring them up. It's going to be a serious challenge or a complication. God's really going to have to work on them. And we overlook some of the people that seem not so bad and think, well, it would be a lot easier for God to reach them as opposed to those that are mostly bad. But the truth is the scripture never points out people that are mostly bad and mostly good. There's no bad scale. There's no differentiation. There's you're lost and you're found. You're lost and you're found. There's no distinguishing between levels of sin. All sin is seen as the same It's equal evil. And the beautiful thing is, is that all sinners are equally lovable. All sinners are equally welcomed into his grace and welcomed into his love. There's no distinguishing between those who are super bad and those who are sort of bad. We're all lost and alone without him. We're all hopeless without our Savior. We're all without an answer if we don't have Christ in our life. Like I said earlier, he's not an answer. He is the answer. Romans 5, 6 through 11 in the message, it said Christ arrives right on time to make this happen. He didn't and doesn't wait for us to get ready. He presented himself for this sacrificial death when we were too weak and rebellious to do anything to get ourselves ready. And even if we hadn't been so weak, we wouldn't have known what to do anyway. We can understand someone dying for a person worth dying for, and we can understand how someone good and noble could inspire us to a selfless sacrifice. 
But God put his love on the line for us by offering his son in sacrificial death while we were off, uh, while we were of no use whatever to him. Now that we are set right with God by means of his sacrificial death, the consummate blood sacrifice. There is no longer a question of being at odds with God in any way. If when we were at our worst, we were put on friendly terms with God by the sacrificial death of his son. And now that we're at our best, just think, of how our lives will expand and deepen by the means of his resurrection life. Now that we have actually received the amazing friendship with God, we are no longer content to simply say it in plodding prose. We sing and shout our praises to God through Jesus the Messiah. And those are some powerful and significant words. Those are some powerful and significant words. His love and acceptance is for everyone and anyone. His love and acceptance is for everyone and anyone. And some people might think that I love this character more than others in the Bible, but um, I'm going to talk to you guys about Zacchaeus today. We, We know him from our kids' Uh, singing songs about Zacchaeus being a wee little man. A wee little man was he, climbed up in a sycamore tree. (laughs) You guys were looking at me like, do you know that? Okay. Good. (laughs) We know very, we, we know a few things about Zacchaeus according to the word. We know that he was a tax collector and we know that he was a chief at tax collecting. And we'll talk about that in just a minute. But we also know that he was really short. (laughs) And to get God's attention, he climbed up into a tree. And I'm hoping that through this story, as I talk to you guys about the story of Zacchaeus, you'll gain an understanding, you'll gain a perspective about who Jesus Christ is in his friendship to us. We're going to start in Luke chapter 19, verse 1. Um, It'll be up there on the screen, too, in the New Living Translation. Jesus entered Jericho and made his way through the town. And there was a man named Zacchaeus. He was the chief tax collector in the region and had had become very rich. He tried to get a look at Jesus, but he was too short to see over the crowd. So he ran ahead and climbed a sycamore fig tree over the crowd. So, so I'm sorry, beside the road for Jesus was going to pass that way. And when Jesus came by, he looked up at Zacchaeus and called him by name. Zacchaeus, he said, quick, come down. I must be a guest in your home today. Zacchaeus quickly climbed down and took Jesus to his house in great excitement and joy. But the people were displeased. He's gone to be the guest of a notorious sinner, they grumbled. Meanwhile, Zacchaeus stood before the Lord and said, I will give half my wealth to the poor, Lord. And if I have cheated people on their taxes, I will give them back four times as much. Jesus responded, salvation has come to this home today, for this man has shown himself to be a true son of Abraham. For the son of man came to seek and save those who were lost. I want you guys to understand what tax collectors in that day were. If you go into the scriptures and you really begin to understand the history of it, you will find that tax collectors were the hated of that time. They were the cheats. They were the embezzlers of the time. They cheated people for a profession. They were responsible. Usually tax collectors were people of Israel descent that were recruited by Rome, a nation that was overseeing the Israelites to collect taxes for Caesar. And as they would go about collecting taxes, whatever they would have to meet a quota with Rome, and then whatever was left over from making that quota, they were able to earn for themselves. So they weren't able to take a chunk of the taxes they collected. All of that money needed to be sent out. And so Zacchaeus and other tax collectors were really, really good at cheating and scheming. They would go door to door and require the the taxes that were supposed to go to Rome. And in the process... 
they would elevate the costs so that they could have some for themselves. And we know that Zacchaeus was a really, really rich man. The company, the, the company that he kept probably wasn't good, and he probably had a whole lot. And I would imagine that Zacchaeus enjoyed flaunting it. I'm sure he was an entrepreneur of sorts. I mean, for the Rome to ask Zacchaeus to be a part of their work there and the tax collecting um, meant that they saw potential in him. They saw him as someone who could gain much money from the Israelite people, from the Jews. And so Zacchaeus then somehow in the process was promoted to a chief tax collector. And, And my perspective about this is he was probably kind of like an overseer of several different tax collectors that would go about collecting money. And I'm sure that he took a cut of what they were collecting from the people. And so, like, I mean, he was a professional, at cheating people. He was a professional at doing this kind of, 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 of cutting people away from their money and taking things that belong to them. And for me, in understanding who Zacchaeus was, this makes him a major reject. Zacchaeus was infamous. He was legendary. He was notorious. <laughs> and and I, I mean, I'm sure that Zacchaeus really didn't mind being hated. I'm sure that Zacchaeus had a lot of things. I mean, for Zacchaeus to be so full into this, to be considered a chief of tax collectors, means that he was high ranking in this role. He probably lived in a very big house. He probably had servants who fanned him whenever he wanted to. I'm sure that this man was sitting in a place of great luxury. And people feared him. Not in a good way. And I'm, you know, I know that it might, be, it might seem like I'm, I'm grabbing a lot from the story, but I'm sure that Zacchaeus really didn't, didn't care. And then Zacchaeus is going about his thing. And Zacchaeus being of Jewish descent, I'm sure that he had heard stories of the Messiah that was coming. Of the prophecies of the king that was going to come to earth. And he heard news about this Jesus Christ figure. And it was of his understanding that maybe perhaps this is the Messiah. There's some people talking about it. There's some people rumoring about it. Jesus enters and rumors have it that Jesus might actually be the Messiah. Now some people, and I know that it could probably go either way, but... Walk with me for a minute. Some people believe that Zacchaeus climbing up into that tree was a fit of desperation to grab Jesus' attention because he was lost and hopeless. But I tend to believe that knowing where Zacchaeus was in his life, being a chief tax collector and having all this wealth, I'm sure that he was trying to seek an opportunity with one famous person to another. Like, he was short. And the crowds are pressing pressing in. They're trying to get together and and find out who this Jesus is. And they're trying to gather around him. And they're crowding him in. And Zacchaeus is just frustrated. He can't gain access to him. So he climbs up a tree thinking, one famous man to another. Maybe he's heard about me. Maybe he knows about me. I'm going to grab a hold of Jesus' attention. One one, One famous man to another infamous man. I'm sure that he thought to himself, I don't know what Jesus would save me from. I mean, he has wealth. He has belongings. He has everything that he wants. He's full of his own riches and his own glory. I'm sure that he's just merely seeking to impress Jesus. (laughs) He's thinking that he has something to flaunt. And Zacchaeus was pretty proud of what he had. But something bizarre happens. And Jesus is walking down the street. Zacchaeus climbs up in the tree. And Jesus catches eye contact with Zacchaeus. And he goes, he's Zacchaeus. What? (laughs) Like, how did he find out? Zacchaeus has got to probably be thinking, how does he even know my name? How does he even know who I am? How does he even know me? I'm, okay, you know. And Jesus says, well, you know, 
come down. We're going to go have lunch or supper at your house. (laughs) And God calls an opportunity. Jesus calls an opportunity and, and the rejected, the hardened, the selfish man. Zacchaeus is given an opportunity to sit with the king, with the Messiah. And I'm sure that in this moment, though, Zacchaeus is still kind of relishing in the moment. I mean, all the upstanding religious Jews for, who, are, who are biding time just to find a moment with Jesus to get a nod, a handshake, nothing. And the chief tax collector, a miserable crook of a man, is given an opportunity to sit and have a meal with Jesus Christ. I'm sure that he's relishing in the moment. He's, he's looking at himself thinking, look how great and grand I am. Uh, look, look at the attention that I got. Look at this opportunity at me. You know, and All the religious leaders, as we read in the scripture, are grumbling and frustrated because Jesus is now going to sit down with a sinner, with a cheat. And I'm sure that Zacchaeus invited all of his friends. He's gathering all these people to come with them to partake or be a part of this meal. I imagine that they're all sitting around this table looking at Jesus, wondering what he's going to say, probing him, or maybe speaking eloquently about how much they have and how rich they become trying to impress him and trying to make him realize how special and how great they are. There's a climactic moment that takes place in this story. There comes a moment where Zacchaeus decides that I'm changing everything. Zacchaeus decides that everything about his life, everything about who he is, everything about his own life must change. Something unexpected, something unexplainable began to stir in this man's heart. A man who thought to himself, I have it all. Zacchaeus arrives at a point and realizes how truly impoverished he is. A man who has everything takes notice. But the truth is, is he has nothing. How long did he have an audience for the living God? How long did he have an audience with the Savior? How long did he have a conversation with Zacchaeus before Zacchaeus began to realize That there's something different about this man. There's something real, something significant, something powerful. Uh, Listen to these words. Zacchaeus must have thought, nobody listens to me except for the few guys who work for me. But this guy cares. He listens. He gets it. I can imagine Zacchaeus looking into the most compassionate eyes he has ever seen and thinking, does Jesus really know who I am? Does he really know who he's around? Does he really know what I do for a living? Does Jesus even know what paid for the fish and food that we're eating at this table? Does he know what paid for this house? He must know, but he chooses not to reject me. Whatever happened in the time frame that they were together, something miraculous and something significant and something powerful changed in the man Zacchaeus himself. Something significant began to shift in his thinking. Something powerful began to shape his heart in an entirely different way. The calloused, money-hungry man is about to go broke and he doesn't even care. One moment with Jesus took a man radical about getting all that he wanted in this life to being radical about giving it all away. (laughs) It's a shame sometimes I wonder what they talked about. The Bible doesn't describe it. It doesn't define it. It doesn't explain what the words they exchanged were. It doesn't say what they had a conversation about. It just merely says that they sat down and had a meal together. And perhaps the Lord knew that we would try to turn it into some kind of equation or some kind of program to help change people. I don't know. But I personally think more than biblical perspective, more than religious thoughts, 
more than biblical, you know, actions or things that Jesus pointed out to him. I think the thing that changed him the most is that he spent time with Jesus himself. He encountered the Savior. It was a connection that took place between him and the Creator. And this is the point that I want to make to you guys this morning, and I hope that you grab this. The truth is, is many of us are just like Zacchaeus. Many of us are walking around attempting to tout our accomplishments or seeking favor by religious action and anxiety-driven devotion. We're all climbing our own sycamore trees. We're trying to grab Jesus' attention any way possible. We're flagging him down and we're waving him down. We see him in interaction with other people. We see people crowding in on him. And we're just thinking to ourselves, how do I get attention with this man? How do I find Jesus Christ? And Zacchaeus climbs himself up a tree and begins to tout about all the things that he does. For some reason, perhaps, just maybe, Zacchaeus thought that all that he had, his wealth, his belongings, his personal charisma, was going to grab Jesus' attention. But the powerful thing about this story is, is Jesus knew his name before Zacchaeus even said a thing. All Zacchaeus did was climb into that tree. All Zacchaeus did was show some initiative to try to grab his attention, probably for the wrong reasons entirely. And Jesus Christ turns around and calls him by name. Some of us, we can't see past ourself. We can't see past our distractions. Some of us can't see past our own pride and ego. But it wasn't those things that saved Zacchaeus. It wasn't his wealth, all that he had, or all that he thought he was showing God, or showing the Son of God. It was Jesus Christ himself. It was mercy. It was grace. It was forgiveness. This was Jesus Christ's initiative. And sometimes we need to recognize We don't have to climb into a sycamore tree for God to stop and take notice of us. We don't have to do all these splendorous and wondrous things for God to, to, for us to grab God's attention. You see, Jesus stopped that day and he stopped of his own choosing. He stopped because he's gracious. He stopped because he's good. He stopped because he knew Zacchaeus had a name just as he knows you and me. And he told Zacchaeus to hurry down from that tree, that he wanted to be with him, that he wanted to spend time with him, that he wanted to go to where he goes. Jesus didn't care about the company that he kept. He didn't care about what kind of lifestyle led him to that place. He didn't care about what notorious name Zacchaeus had made for himself. He didn't care that Zacchaeus was a hated cheat in his culture. Jesus didn't come, as, as the scripture said that we were reading just a few minutes ago. At the end of that, he adds in verse 10, For the Son of Man came to seek and save those who are lost. Who are lost. I'm going back to some of the point I was making earlier. I wonder if Zacchaeus' friends looked around and saw what was happening there and thought to themselves, if there's hope for Zacchaeus, there's hope for me. If there's hope for Zacchaeus, there's hope for me. It's important for us to realize that Jesus is not our accuser, he's not our prosecutor, he's not our judge. He's our friend, and he's our rescuer. He's our friend, and he's our rescuer. This story is powerful in its definition and defining who Jesus Christ is. Jesus Christ decided to be a friend that day. He decided to spend time with a corrupt and morally evil man. A man that had... So much of his own. 
And Jesus allowed himself to become a friend of him. Allowed himself to step into his situation, in his environment, in his place. I'm reminded of Revelation 3.20. It says, look, I stand at the door and knock. If you hear my voice and open the door, I will come in and we will share a meal together. We will share a meal together. I want to encourage you guys this morning. I'm reminded of a familiar hymn that we hear quite a bit, something that that we don't always recognize the words to. I'm going to start reading them. What a friend we have in Jesus, all our sins and griefs to bear. What a privilege to carry everything to God in prayer. Oh, what peace we often forfeit. Oh, what goodness, good, or what we needless pain we bear, all because we do not carry everything to God in prayer. Have we trials and temptations in their trouble anywhere? We should never be discouraged. Take it to the Lord in prayer. Can we find a friend so faithful who will all our sorrows share? Jesus knows our every weakness. Take it to the Lord in prayer. Are you weak and heavy laden, cumbered with a load of care, precious Savior, still our refuge. Take it to the Lord in prayer. Do your friends despise, forsake you? Take it to the Lord in prayer. In his arms he'll take and shield you. You will find a solace there. Blessed Savior, thou hast promised thou wilt all our burdens bear. May we ever, Lord, be bringing all to thee in earnest prayer. Soon in glory, bright unclouded there, will be no need for prayer. Rapture, praise, and endless worship will be our sweet portion there. I wonder that moment in Zacchaeus' life as he's found time with the Savior and he's thinking to himself, he's going to impress him. And then just a, sh- a short time, an afternoon with Jesus, Zacchaeus begins to realize how broken he is. Zacchaeus begins to realize how corrupt he is. Zacchaeus begins to realize how evil he is, how much of a cheat he is. And then he realizes that Jesus sought him out. That Jesus knows him fully. That Jesus knows everything about him. If Jesus knows him by name, though Zacchaeus has never met him, then surely Jesus knows Zacchaeus' actions. Surely he knows Zacchaeus' lifestyle. Surely he knows the man. And it dawns on him. The Son of God has come to spend time with someone as wretched as me. We have got to understand this truth. Because some of us, we feel so far from his grace. We feel so far from his mercy. We feel so distanced from his love. We know people in our life who are in the same place. Who say to themselves, I've got to do this. I've got to change this. I've got to fix this. I've got to put my life in order before I can even step in through the doors of a church. I've got to align my life and do things right before I can even meet God. And Jesus looks at us and welcomes us fully and completely knowing every detail and fact about us. Church, he knows the most rotten secrets that you've ever kept. And he still wants to meet with you. He still wants to be with you. He still wants to be your friend. He still wants to love you. It's so important that we recognize this attribute of Jesus. 
I know this is kind of on the fly, but if one of our worship team members knows this song and wants to come and sing it as we close this morning. This is a question I want to ask you as we finish up this morning. How will you walk away from your own attempts to gain his attentions and respond to the invitation Jesus is giving you? You already have his attention. You already have it. He loves you. He cares about you. He knows everything about you. But that's not kept him from loving you. That's not kept him from seeking you. One of the most beautiful things in the, in the story of the prodigal son is the father actually runs at the son. I mean, just runs at him. He's after you. Before you even climb in a tree, he knows you by name. And he wants to meet with you. He wants to have time with you. He wants to love you. He wants to be your friend. And he wants to rest you. As you sing this song, I want to ask that you be honest about that question. How will you stop? How will you stop by your own intentions to seek his attention and accept the fact that he's already come to you and he's already with you and he already wants to be with you regardless of your history. You know what? Some of you right now, it's not your history. It's your right now. You're living in a pretty sinful moment. You're making some bad choices and doing some dumb things. He still loves you. He still absolutely adores you. Thank you, God. Thank you, God. back to Romans for just a minute. I'm going to read this and pray. Romans 5 in the message. Verse 9, it says, Now that we are set, free, set right with God by means of His sacrificial death, His blood sacrifice, there's no longer a question of being at odds with God in any way. If, when we were at our worst, we were put on friendly terms with God by the sacrificial death of His Son. Now that we're at our best, just think of how our lives will expand and deepen by the means of His resurrection life. Now that we have actually received this amazing friendship with God, we are no longer content to simply say it in plotting prose. We sing and shout our praises to God through Jesus the Messiah. Father God, I thank you for this morning. Jesus, I thank you for your friendship. I thank you that you came into a culture that was broken, a culture that was devastated by evil, and you allowed yourself to spend time with the most corrupt of sinners. That in doing so, you revealed to us that we are never too far gone. That we don't have to act in a way in an attempt to gain your grace or your mercy or seek your affections. But you already know us by name and you already love us. I thank you today for your mercy. I thank you today for your love. I thank you today for your friendship that I am free today, that I am released today. I love you, God. I thank you, Jesus Christ. I pray that this truth, Jesus is, you, Jesus, are our friend, would hit us in a real way this morning and that we would welcome you in, dwell with you, and sit with you and let you love us regardless of our mistakes and our failures. And that when we look at grace and we look at love and we look at mercy in the face, that it would change everything about our lives. 
that it would turn some of the most radical of sinners into the most radical, radical free. It's in Jesus Christ's name we pray. Amen.